Welcome to Prison, The Hidden Sentence, raising awareness and providing education and insights for individuals and families with incarcerated loved ones, educating and empowering through personal stories of those affected by and involved with our prison population. Hi, this is Julia, and we're offering workshops like Reentry for Families on the Outside to prepare them for when their incarcerated loved one is released. If you're looking for ways to advertise your business, you can promote your business on a Prison the Hidden Sentence podcast. For more information, email contact at prisonthehiddensentence.com. You can also purchase the Prison the Hidden Sentence book on Amazon. Hey, everyone. This is Julia Lazarek with Prison the Hidden Sentence. And today I'm here with Lori Britt, who lives in Canada and is married with six children, some by birth and others that joined her family. She'll explain more in the podcast. Having two children in the criminal justice system has affected her life, and she wants to help others that are experiencing shame attached to their grief. She loves painting and writing and has found healthy outlets such as archery, golf, and cooking. She said that making food and giving it to others fills her heart to nurture others. She spent most of her working life working for the government and never experienced anyone going to prison before. Lori, thank you so much for being here today and speaking with me. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We spoke a bit before this, and I always like to start at the beginning. So can we talk about how you found out your sons were incarcerated and how you handle it? Absolutely. It was very early morning, about 2 a.m., and I got a phone call from my girlfriend. And she had told me that my son had called her son crying and asked for them to come and help him. And when they got there, he was not on the side of the road waiting. He was in the back of a police car, and they wouldn't let her talk to him or anything. So they came to my house to let me know that my son had been arrested, though we had no idea why or what for or anything like that. I kind of already knew because, you know, your kids, if their behavior is funny, it was my son's birthday and hadn't showed up like he was supposed to. So I wasn't overly shocked that something bad had happened, but I didn't expect it to be as dramatic and as much as it was. I phoned the RCMP, obviously, as soon as she got to my house and they wouldn't give me any information. Well, people from the United States, tell us what the RCMP stands for. Oh, right. I'm sorry. So it's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry about that. And so I had phoned them because obviously they had my son from what my girlfriend said, but they told me that they couldn't give me that information because we have privacy laws here. And so they don't have to tell you if they have somebody or anything if they don't really want to due to privacy. So I waited a little bit thinking, oh, how am I going to figure this out? And so I remember one time I had to call before. And so I used the system to my advantage. And what I did was I called back and I told them that I wanted to report a missing person because I hadn't seen my son in 24 hours. So therefore I could report that. And at that point in time is when they had to tell me that they had him in custody. They still wouldn't tell me why they had him or what he had done, but that was about as much as they would tell me. And they tell me that the serious crime investigator would get back to me once they knew what was happening. And then the next morning, so it's like probably about seven o'clock, same morning, but it feels like hours and hours, seven or eight, I got a phone call from the serious crime investigator and I was excited. I thought they were going to tell me all about what was happening and I could talk to my son and life was going to be great. I had this great delusional belief of, how it looks from watching way too many TV shows. I was crushed. They didn't talk to me about my son, Drake, at all. What they wanted to know was where my boy Christopher was because he was the second accused. And all they would tell me is that it was a serious crime and that somebody was injured and how it fared depended on how that person survived. So it was a whirlwind of a mess. I think I described it as your house. There's a bad storm and a wrecking ball destroys your house. And there's debris everywhere. And you're sitting there because they tell you to sit and wait. It's pouring down rain. It's a mess. And you're drenched. And it's disgusting. And here you are sitting in this demolished home 
waiting for somebody to come help you. It was horrible. I can't even explain the chaos and pain that I felt, not just one, but two boys. I mean, what the heck? So I'm not sure if I went off track. I talk, <laughs> I'm a talker and it gets me going, but yeah, it was devastating. It was really quite devastating. So what happened next? After they called me and asked about Christopher, which I'm not going to lie, it infuriated me because they could tell me nothing about Drake, not a thing. They weren't even going to tell me that they had him and that he was in custody. But here they are phoning me and wanting information about another one of my children. I thought, how can this be? Like, you get kind of afraid. What do you want to say? Do, if I say anything, am I incriminating them? Am I getting them in trouble? I don't know how the system works. I didn't even know really if I was doing the right thing. And so I, all I really wanted to do was talk to Drake and then make sure Christopher was safe, worried about what was going to happen to him. Obviously, he was safer at the moment. I struggled. That day, I just kind of, I don't know, the world fell beneath my feet and I was in some deep, dark hole in a matter of seconds. And I kind of canceled everything. I went to my hometown and visited my family. And then the next day, so that was a Friday night. By Saturday, they phoned me again. They still had not found Christopher. He was on the run and they wanted me to talk to Drake. I probably will cry. Sorry. So I was like, oh, great, finally. But the reason they wanted me to talk to Drake was because he was so distraught that they could not get any information out of him. And he was sobbing and crying and it was awful. So they let me talk to him basically so that they could calm him down enough to get information out of him, right? The whole weekend consisted of kind of that stuff, the serious crime investigator calling. We got Drake a lawyer, still hadn't found Christopher, and then you have court, right? So it doesn't feel like much probably happens when I'm speaking about it, but emotionally your heart has just exploded. You just are a crumble of ooh. So trying to even get up to function, to believe that this is your reality is insane. And yeah, I think a lot of families could relate to that. And then when was court after that weekend? Well, they go for Monday. So they picked him up on Friday. They kept Drake in the city cells till Monday. We went into court Monday morning. Again, I had this great delusion that I was going to hug my son and talk to him and make sure things were great. He was okay. It didn't work like that. They shuffle him in handcuffed. He's behind a plexiglass. It's terrible. <laughs> and he was crying, sobbing, of course. I mean, he's newly 21. I'm sure trying to wrap his head around his own behavior, let alone seeing your family sitting there for you. And then they don't sentence him right away because but they tell him what he's getting charged with, and then they take him away and wait for charging. So any time that he did, while waiting for sentencing, would go towards his time served. So, yeah, it was super yucky. So you went to court the first time. You had your family there. You had some support, but we all know how it affects us, and our heart just drops. So I can totally relate to that, and I think others can too. And luckily, you did have an attorney. Was the other young man there at that time or when did he come in? Christopher didn't get picked up till about a week or so after Drake. And it was completely different. Christopher had problems before and had been in the system before. He was a little bit more prepared. He knew what he was going into. He knew what was going on. I didn't even get to go to Christopher's appearance the first time because it happened so fast. They didn't even tell me they picked up Christopher. How I found out that Christopher had gotten picked up was I was on the phone with Drake and there was a lot of chaos going around in the background and Drake was a little bit distracted and I was a little bit irritated because it's a 20 minute wait for them to go through the whole cycle to accept the collect call from the prison, blah, blah. Then you finally get on the phone and you get this, like, talk to me. (laughs) I can't see you. I'm still your mom. I want to hear. And then there was so much. I finally said, what is going on? Why is it so crazy there? Because you could hear the hoopla and the Drake's like, oh, new inmates are coming. And then he kind of paused and I could hear his excitement. He just said nothing, but I could feel that something had shifted for him. And then he yelled out, yo, brother. And so I knew that Christopher was there. That's how I found out Chris got picked up. I mean, I didn't even get to support him. 
So, Lori, it looks like Christopher had been in trouble before. Yes, actually, Christopher has been in trouble. Christopher had been in trouble a few times. When Christopher got in trouble and ended up in the system, we were still a family, but it was a different circumstance and wasn't quite as serious as what was happening now. And so because it was so little and it wasn't as same as the severity of what they were doing, I didn't really even think about that relating that Christopher had been in trouble before. And you consider him your son too. A hundred percent. Christopher has been in our life for an extremely long time. When this time, when Chris and Drake both got in trouble, people used to always say to me, or even prior, you shouldn't let him hang out. Are you going to let Drake hang out with Chris? And I used to say, well, should I let Chris hang out with Drake? I mean, they're peas in a pod. Whether they were with each other or not, they would find somebody like, likes hang with likes. And no doubt Christopher and Drake have a brother bond and have similarities that nobody can destroy. They get to make their own choices and those kind of things. But definitely Chris is one of my boys for sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. So now Drake and Chris see each other and you know that they're both there. And then what happens next? Well, they get to stay in what we have here is a holding prison. So they got to stay in the holding prison. So Christopher is very adaptable. He knows how to behave. He's a yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. He will do as he's told. He'll follow the structure, but really do what he wants. But he lets people believe that he is hearing and listening. Drake is not the same. Drake is defiant. He beats to his own drum. He's not as accommodating. I do believe that Drake had a harder time adapting and Christopher could adapt. Christopher had skills and knowledge that Drake didn't. And so Christopher helped him to survive within the system, which I'm 100% grateful for. But because Christopher could have better behaviors and knew what to do and how to behave and also got a lesser sentence, he went to a less secure prison. So for a while there, I had him at one prison and I could see them both. And then Chris went to a less secure. We tried to get Drake went there for a very brief time, but because of his behaviors and his temperament, he didn't last there very long. And then he went to a more harder prison. So it was quite a journey for sure, trying to balance myself between prisons, different towns. I mean, to see Drake, I had to take a ferry and an hour drive. So it was like a three hour drive for a half hour visit. I had my husband one time say, this is a lot of work for a visit. And my theory was, I'd do it for you. And he's like, what would I go to prison for? I'm like, I don't know anything, drinking and driving. I mean, it's just, you didn't get caught, right? I mean, it can happen anytime. So it was hard. He's done it, but anybody could have have a drink and drive. So, well, I mean, (laughs) well, I didn't mean him, but like, when you go for dinner, you have a beer, you can have one beer, drive home and well, If you get pulled over, I think with the liquor limits or the alcohol limits here, you could get your car taken away at that point in time. Yeah. So don't drink and drive. When you go to visit, you hadn't really done that. What was that like? Oh my gosh. So the first visit I ever had, Christopher wasn't picked up yet. And I had gone to Wilkinson Prison, which is in Victoria. It looks like this old dungy castle. People think, oh, I'm going to go to the castle and I'm going to see the queen and it's going to be beautiful. Well, I can tell you if castles look anything like that prison, which is what it reminded me of, it was disgusting. It was horrible. It had nothing but a dread of ooh over it. It's cold. It stinks. You walk in and it's like the life inside of you just kind of gets closed off. You see these people, nobody makes eye contact because everybody's got a bit of shame and guilt attached to why they're there. Nobody talks about why they're there. There's no communication. So it's tense. And then the guards, of course, are super aggressive and shut down. And then it's like walking into a hospital, like it's kind of got that sickly smell. You know, when you walk into a hospital and it's got that sickly smell, but it's just way more negative. Yeah, it's a horrible experience. My first experience, I cried. I wanted to cry a lot. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where I was supposed to go. I didn't know how I was supposed to behave or what I could do or not do. And it was trying. And then you got to strip down all your stuff, take off your shoes, take off your belts, go through scans. And and then they lock you in a little room. And I mean, they lock you in the room, which I did not anticipate. I didn't realize that 
once you're in this room, they lock the doors and you're there. And it was the worst feeling. I thought I can't escape. I can't leave. I can't do anything. I'm stuck with all this stuff. And I'm stuck in this room with people I don't know. And I'm emotional beyond belief. But I don't want to cry because I don't want my son to see me crying because it will just break his heart. And in that second, I thought, I'm only doing this for half an hour tops. My boy is doing this for years. And I thought, huh, it gives you a little taste of possibly what it must feel like to be incarcerated, but not. You know what I mean? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really tough. I'm not going to lie. Your first visit is really hard. And I would like to tell you that visits after that get easier, but they don't. It's like running into a brick wall, your body being completely crushed, your heart's broken, you're bleeding, and yet you get up and you run back into that wall time and time again until they are done their sentence. I understand the guard told me very few parents or people go visit their children in prison, and that is probably why. It's tough. It's really tough. Yeah, I know it's difficult to visit. And we do know that it does really help our loved one that's incarcerated. So when you do it, even though it's difficult, you know that you're helping them. How else do you communicate with them? You go and Oh, I did lots. (laughs) I was probably one of the weird people, I'm sure. So at one point in time, I had my son in one prison, Fraser. I had my ex-husband and his brother in a different one at in Regina. And then my other boy, Christopher, at Brandon Lake. So I would make crossword puzzles and I would have to do make up the crossword. And I'd do them of all sorts of different ones. Like that one was music because it would appeal to everybody. So I'd make the crossword and then I'd photocopy them. So I'd have three. Then I do my questions on a different page and photocopy. And then I do my answer key. And I would have to give the answer key in a separate envelope in the mail so that the guards knew that I wasn't trying to plan an escape or and had to get authorized that I could make them and send them. I would do things like that. So we wrote a lot and I visit and they'd phone. I mean, they phone all the time. Lots of things. I'd send Drake. Chris taught Drake how to write. So one of the things that Drake got to gain as a skill while he was incarcerated was writing, like legit writing, not printing, but actually using his penmanship and writing, which was fantastic. So we wrote lots, we encouraged, and we got to talk a lot about emotions. I wrote them songs, rap songs, basically, send them cards. Yeah. I tried to make it as normalized as I could for them. I mean, I think the biggest thing was I had to let them know that I loved them no matter what. Like I said, visiting and communication is so important. And maybe we'll have you rap for us later. We'll see. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I probably have the song somewhere around here. I kept every letter. And so I'm sure that I probably have. I even have some of the crossword puzzles that I made for them. And I remember people used to be like, you made crosswords? It's challenging to try to get all your words to go together. And But at least I knew they were doing something and it kept them occupied and maybe more connected to humanity or something. Yeah, that's so important. And I need to go back because you had Drake and Chris, but then there was somebody else that you visited? No, I didn't visit them. That was my ex-husband. Him and his brother ended up in being incarcerated in Regina the same time Drake was in prison. And so I only got to talk to my ex-husband about Drake probably a little bit when it first happened and probably about a couple weeks later, a week or two later, him and his brother ended up in prison. That was it. I mean, so I would talk to him on the phone, not often, but, you know, he would call and chat and sent him letters and stuff like that. But I didn't really get to, he didn't get to be a supportive dad in that aspect of it. You know, one of the things that you said earlier when we were talking is that people judge you. So Mm -hmm. here you are, a government worker, taking care of six kids, Susie Homemaker, just taking care of everybody. And now you have two kids that are incarcerated along with this ex-husband that's a while back. But did you face a lot of judgment from people? Oh, a hundred percent. Some people did it face on and some people did it very unknowingly. My town isn't very big and it was very big news. So it was on the TV, it was on the radio, it was in the newspaper and I'd be at work sometimes 
and there would be somebody at the till and maybe it said it on the radio about a situation about what was happening and you could hear them. They would be like, well, can you imagine that parent? I wonder what that one's like. Oh, I wonder how that house was raised in. They didn't know that they were judging me, but I remember sitting there sometimes thinking, yeah, that's me, the mom, right? They had this image of what they thought I was as a mom. There was people that would say things like, well, maybe it's the best place for them. I don't know a soul that feels that the best place for their child is prison. I don't care what age your child is. No parent wants their child to be in prison. And if anybody ever had to go to a prison to visit their child, they would probably never say those words again, right? I mean, it's easy for us to say things that we don't understand. And maybe I might have myself back in a time, right? But this definitely made me acutely aware of the things I say. When somebody has lost a child, I don't say, oh, maybe they're in a better place. I'm not saying that heaven isn't great, or, but no parent wants to believe their child is in a better place when they're gone. They want their child with them. Like It really opened up my mind in an avenue of what I say when people are in pain, because it's just more painful. Like The best place for him? No, the best place for my children are with me. Safe, secure, growing, being the best humans that they can possibly be. They made some pretty bad choices, but I would hate to believe that is going to define them for the rest of their lives when they've done so many good things and they have so many great qualities that this one thing is going to be what is attached to them for the rest of their lives. I find that shameful. Yeah, we always say it's not who they are, it's what they did. And who hasn't done something if they were judged for it, that they could be in the same place. And so tell us a little bit about your family and your home life, because you are a good mom and you love your children and you instill good qualities in them. So when somebody hears that you have two children that are incarcerated, what was the home life like? (laughs) Well, when people hear that I had two boys incarcerated, they're very set back to begin with because A, I talk about it. And I know a lot of people don't like it when I talk about it, but I refuse for us to walk around with our heads hung in shame. I love my boys immensely. And I'm not going to not stop talking about them. And I use it as a gift to share, to help, to praise. Home life, I mean, I'm not going to say our home life is perfect. I come from a family of mental health and addiction and dysfunction, just like the mass majority of us. Definitely did my best. And I think that was one of my saving graces when the boys went to prison was that I knew in my heart of hearts that I loved them to the best of my ability. Nobody could love those guys more than I did. I gave them tools. I talked to them. I would share as much as I could with them. I had a very open home where you could talk about things that were uncomfortable. I didn't want them to go in and get advice from somebody else. I'd rather have the honest conversations with them. And so I don't know, like I don't 100% know how to answer that because I don't believe that the home life had much to do with why they ended up going to prison. I believe that they had their own life and their own journey. I don't believe that they knew the ripple effect of what their behaviors were going to be, but do any of us, right? I mean, when you do something and it goes bad, do you really think, oh, how is that going to affect so-and-so and so-and-so when you're doing it? No, but when it's done is when it hits. And so I believe this is their life lessons and their journey, and I just want to love them through it. Had I not loved them to the best of my ability, I mean, I had another government job prior to the one that I was at when they got in trouble, and I quit that job. It was a $25 an hour job, which was good back then. And I quit to go to a $9 an hour job so that I could be land-based. So I used to work on a ferry and I'd be in the middle of the drink and I would get these phone calls about the boys misbehaving. And then it's a two hour boat ride or a four hour boat ride, depending on where I am to get to them. So it was getting more challenging to parent. So for me, it was better to quit and be a better parent than to have the dollars. And that's just the route. So I think that helped me. I think when they, when all of this happened, I kind of just was like devastated, but grateful for choices. Well, I was just in a meeting where we did talk about the ripple effects. So I'm really glad that you brought it up because a lot of people don't realize that how it affects people around them. And then we're also talking about that people that are incarcerated, they come from good families. They come from families that 
have issues. I mean, they come from all types of families. So it's really can't look at a family and say, oh, well, he or she came from a bad family. Correct. So I really like the way that you brought it up. And you did say a few words that I wanted you to tell us what they mean. You said in the drink, is that oh. water? <laughs> yeah. So drink is water. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to be clear, like, no, she wasn't working drinking. No. She was on a ferry in the water in the drink. Yeah. I don't know if that's a uh, fairy slang or if it's just slang that's really old, but yes, in the drink means in the water. Yeah, no, I love it. I just wanted to <laughs> clarify that. And so right now, where are the two boys? Or oh, men? I should say men. They are in their they, 20s. Yeah. They were 21 when they got arrested and now they are both 32. Oh, no, I'm lying. They're both 30. Wow. Well, it's been a journey. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long one. So after their time was served, Christopher got out and did very well till Drake got out. I mean, he partied a bit, but he was a little bit more open and honest about his journey. And him and I spent a lot of time together. He integrated back into society, like no problem. His time was quite short. Then when Drake got out, he was out for a while. Anyways, Drake met a girl and got a job and Chris went more back into drugs and alcohol. So Chris was on the streets for, I want to say, a good six years. And then he just got picked up not very long ago and is back in the system. Then he got out for a bit. Now he's back in the system. So he's doing okay. He is talking about maybe going for treatment and getting better. But all I can do is love him through it. So I book my visits. I write my letters and I stay in touch and I let him know he is loved. The most important thing for me with Christopher is that he knows no matter what, I love him. And he has so much shame attached to his own behavior that I end up protecting him a little bit. I saw him on the streets one time and I was so excited because I hadn't seen him for a few years. I mean, I look for him, but they're hard to find. And I yelled. I'm like, Chris, I was so excited. And he didn't want to look at me. He didn't want to talk to me. I was like, and I'm like, give me a hug. And he's like, I'm so dirty. I'm like, I don't care. Hug me anyways. I wanted to throw him in my car and take him home with me, but he was so caught in his addiction that it just wouldn't, it wasn't going to matter what I wanted to do. He was still going to do what he wanted to do. So unfortunately I lost Chris for quite a while, right? Chris is still getting back on track and hopefully he can come home one day, like solid in our hearts, stay with us and be around. Drake, I met a girl, had some babies, went to school, went into treatment He's had some struggles, but is a great dad. He advocates for autism because his son is a little bit on the spectrum. He was the barber in the jail. And so with that, he found a passion for cutting hair. And so when he got out, he went to a barber school. And so he does that, does a great job. He's doing quite well. Drake's doing doing very well. He keeps on trying to educate himself. And I believe that has a lot to do with their behaviors. Drake will very much be accountable for his behavior and he will own it. Christopher is still caught in that everything is happening to him, not for him. So he hasn't been able to accept his own actions in his journey yet. Does that make any sense? Do you know what I'm saying? It does. And I think that's going to help a lot of people because addiction is rampant everywhere. And when you have a loved one who has an addiction, there's only so much you can do. You can love them, you can guide them. But like you said earlier, it's their journey. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to let go and let them live their life and still love them. So I just have so much admiration for you to be able to keep supporting them and not judging them. Well, thank you. It's not always easy. The one thing I learned 100% was when the boys went to prison, I tell my two biological children, I love them infinity. Anybody I love dearly, I usually say, I love you infinity. It's something I learned when I was like four and I've just ran with it. And Christopher didn't want that. He wanted something significant himself. So whenever I see Christopher, I say, I love you much. And so I've always said that I love my kids unconditionally. And even when I saw Christopher on the streets, dirty and disgusting and smelly, and I wanted hugs and he didn't want to give me one. When I left, I still let him know I love him much. I don't judge. I love. I'm always here. And so I really got that challenged. The unconditional love part of being a parent, when you have children that behave poorly and they end up in a system or 
in the paper or making great waves of destruction behind them. You really get to look at loving unconditionally. If you were to ask me a little while ago, I would have said that the prison did nothing. It was nothing good about the boys going to prison. It was horrible. And it still is horrible. However, I've been able to grow and look at things that I have gained and learned from the boys being in prison. And one thing I can say solidly is I truly love my children unconditionally. I, without a doubt, know that I love my boys unconditionally. It's a gift. I'm blessed. I'm blessed that they taught me so many things, that they challenged me in so many ways, and that I was able to expand my heart to be a better mom to them in the process of it all. I think it might be difficult for some parents to relate to that going through it. And I hope that hearing your words will help them so that they can have that unconditional love, that they can still love loved ones. I call them loved ones. It could be their children. It could be a spouse. Mm -hmm. It could be a sibling, yeah. anybody, a friend, right? And still love them unconditionally because, but like you said earlier, it's their journey. So could you tell us what you're doing now to help others and then a little bit about your book that you wrote? Well, I think I do a lot of things to help others, sometimes not even consciously. I believe that I talk about things that are super uncomfortable and I make people uncomfortable. I sometimes feel like I'm Medusa. I have all those snakes on my head and everybody's <laughs> kind of looking at you and points at you and whispers a little bit, but they're afraid to make eye contact because if they do, you might turn them to stone. So I talk about the uncomfortable things. I talk about the boys. I talk about the journey. I talk about all that stuff. But I think the thing that makes people the most uncomfortable is I talk about the lack of support for me, the lack of showing up people did, the lack of empathy or compassion of understanding that I was grieving and they instead focused on the crime of the boys, forgetting to look at uh, my day-to-day -day life had been destroyed. I mean, these boys were a part of my life for 21 years every day, even though they behaved poorly and challenged me at times, they were a very active part of my everyday life. There was not a day that didn't go by that I didn't talk to my kids. To have that ripped from your day-to-day -day life is painful. It's not a death, I know, but it sure feels like one. The amount of pain and heartache you carry is crazy. And it was like it was not acceptable. Like I wasn't supposed to be grieving. I wasn't supposed to have any pain. I was just supposed to accept that my boys had behaved poorly, they were incarcerated, end of story, carry on. And I couldn't. And because I had nobody, I knew nobody that had gone through this. And so I got counseling, I did things, I tried to grow and expand. It was when somebody told me that I was grieving that I was like, oh, that makes sense. And so what I'm doing is making sure that I share the word and I talk about things so that people know that they're not alone. Because that lonely, when you're in that much grief, it's horrible. The shame that comes with it. And I'm not talking about just incarceration. You have shame attached if you got suicide, drug overdose, drinking and driving, sex changes, and all sorts of things that parents get isolated from because their child is doing something. And then they're stuck feeling alone in shame with no support. I don't want people to feel like that. So I am trying to be more out there, advocate for people, share more, talk more, build a support system. I mean, there's a couple of people with the book that have reached out because they had children that went to prison and they had nobody to talk to. And like myself, they felt like they had no one. And so that's what I'm trying to do. We have a peer support group called Prison Families Alliance that is online that everybody is welcome to. And that's at prisonfamiliesalliance.org. I hope you join us there and let others know and how we can support each other there. When did you write your book? How did that come about? Well, I think it came about because I had so much to say that I just kept saying it. So I wrote it. I wrote it because I think that my boys have been painted with a pretty broad brush. I think that I have been painted with somewhat of the same brush. And I think it's important for people to understand the journey. Parenting isn't easy. You add mental health and addiction, it's harder. You add shame, dysfunction, it's harder. And if you're unwilling to look at yourself and grow and find things to be better or advance in, well, it just keeps happening. And I just wanted people to understand that it's 
just to be better, to learn a journey, to expand your heart, to be kind, to have more empathy, to not be so narrow minded, maybe don't mean that in a negative aspect, because I mean, you don't know how somebody's feeling if you've never experienced the feeling like it's hard to have empathy for somebody who lost a parent if you've never lost a parent. So I get that a lot of people don't have empathy for what I went through. But there are people that do because they've been through it, but they're so ashamed and embarrassed about it that they don't talk about it. So that's why I wrote the book. I want it out there. I want people to be able to express and be and reach out if they need. I don't want anybody to feel that alone. So that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to support everybody and anybody that has felt as messed up as I did. So I totally get it. I mean, that's why I wrote Prison, the Hidden Sentence book. So I totally get it because we didn't have the support we needed when we were going through it. So you writing that book is going to help so many people. What's the name of the book again? Yeah, the name of the book is My Heart Behind Bars. It just got launched on the 26th of January. So it's now accessible in Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble. I, there's an international site that you can go to for all the Kindles and all that kind of stuff. And then it's available in Canada. Right now, Chapters has a glitch on switching it over from pre-sale to available, but that should be sorted this week. So, Yeah, so we'll have that in the blog so that people can order your book. And any last words for families going through this? I mean, you've shared so much, and I think you've given us a lot of information throughout our talk. But is there any last words for anybody that has somebody that's entering the prison system? Yeah, be kind to yourself. I think one of the things that I learned very later on was to be gentle with myself. I was pretty harsh. People were harsh and I was harsh. And it wasn't till later that I realized that I needed to be kinder to me because there was so much unkindness out there that I had to be better for myself. I had to find avenues to educate myself, to deal with my pain, to release the anger and anxiety and loneliness and stress that I was feeling. I think that if you have somebody that is just entering the system, that you will probably want to get some counseling. Find something that is far more of and better for you than drinking. Because I can tell you, I went through a little phase there when all you want to do is numb. You don't want to feel, but you have to feel, you have to lean in and you have to share your gross, disgusting story so that your heart can grow and heal. And in the end of it all, is as gross as it is, at the end, you become such a beautiful human that you get to display what you wanted from others. You get to be that person that nobody could be for you. Maybe that's just my experience. I think it's probably everybody's, but I do know that after the journey I've been through, I'm far less judgmental. I'm far more compassionate. And my heart is far more expanded than it was before. And I try to show up for people, even if I don't understand. And I try to be more honest with myself about what I'm going through or what is the trigger or why am I reacting to? And I just think you really have to take care of yourself when you have people going into the system. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. This is Julia. And if you want more information on prison, the hidden sentence workshops, such as reentry for families on the outside to prepare them when their incarcerated loved ones are released, you can go to prison, the hidden sentence.com or email contact at prison, the hidden sentence.com. You can hear more stories or share your story at prison, the hidden sentence.com. And follow us at Hidden Sentence on Facebook and Twitter. We are Prison, the Hidden Sentence, raising awareness one story at a time.